Well, I'm super excited to talk to Dr. Miriam Grossman. Um, Dr. Grossman, I believe you are both an MD as well as a psychologist. Is that correct? No, I'm an MD psychiatrist. Psychiatrist. Okay. <laughs> I always get the two confused, but it's good for people to understand your, your background because um, as I've been reading about the transgender movement, I've been shocked at how much it's been guided by people who do not have a medical background and who, who aren't even credentialed really in um, something like psychiatry. So it's important for people to know that you, you do have um, training in this and experience. Right, so I went to medical school mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I did an internship in pediatrics. And then after that, I did a um, residency in adult psychiatry followed by a fellowship two more years in child and adolescent psychiatry. So the difference, I mean, there's, there's a number of differences between psychiatrists and psychologists, but one of the main ones obviously is that a psychiatrist went to medical school and can prescribe medication. And um, in general, you know, is, is trained and qualified to treat the, the you know, most severely mentally ill, but also, you know, le less. So the whole spectrum of mental illness. So, so when did you start becoming aware of the transgender movement and this concept that is being pushed that children can be born in the wrong body and therefore should be medically transitioned? Well, um, it would have been when I was working at UCLA. I was a psychiatrist there for UCLA students for 12 years. And while I was there, I mean, I left in 2008. So it was, you know, it would have been in the, the 90s and in the 2000 something. Um, I became aware during that time of um, first of, of just the presence of radical ideology, I'll call it within my profession, within um, psychiatry, mental health, but not only mental health, also in other areas of health, um, in women's health. Mm -hmm. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that. Um, so I was really someone who had no idea about um, the left, the right, the politics, um, ideologies, and I, that was just not my thing. I was interested, I was, I was always interested in female health since medical school. I was really intrigued by all the, you know, the, the rhythm of the monthly cycle and the hormone changes and um, how conception happens in pregnancy. And that, that was always an interest of mine. Um, and when I was at UCLA, I noticed that a lot of the patients coming to me, and, and we were a very, very busy clinic. Um, mental health clinics on campus are very, very busy. And I noticed that a lot of the young women that were coming to me were at the root of their um, anxiety or depression was something related to their relationships and specifically their sexual relationships. Wow. So for example, um, STDs, um, you know, a, a diagnosis of, of herpes or HPV or um, a, a pregnancy, an abortion, um, a hookup, getting attached emotionally to a guy who, you know, is only interested in, um, in hooking up, the friend with benefits kind of thing that one of the students said to me, he's getting the benefits, but I'm not getting the friendship. Oh. Um, and so I started to look at what these young women are, and, and men, are being told about um, sexuality and relationships. And that was when I, um, I, I became aware, my, my eyes were open to the ideology that exists um, within um, sex education, um, within the mental health field, and within women's health, uh, OBGYN. And what I mean by that to be more specific is, for example, um, young women 
are more um, vulnerable to sexually transmitted infections because of their biology. Um, the cervix, the entrance to the uterus, um, it, it matures over time. And an immature cervix, which a girl would have, a young woman has until sometime in her 20s, is more vulnerable to infections, much more so than um, the guy that she would be having sexual relations with. And uh, I felt that it was so important for girls to know this. And when I looked at the material that they're taught, uh, well, first of all, when I, when I just spoke directly to them, no one, no one ever heard of this. No one ever heard of an immature cervix and no one ever heard of <laughs> lots of things. Um, and, and I realized that that information is most likely not being made available because it, 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 it would um, highlight the, the differences between male and female, and it would highlight the vulnerability of females, which, which we are. We, we are more vulnerable. We are the ones that get pregnant. We are the ones that are more likely to get an STD. Um, we have to, you know, sometimes have an abortion if, the, if, if that's the case, if that's the situation. And it's so interesting to me because right now there's there's erasure of womanhood, um, and and I remember even thinking when I was younger, um, just how, you know, I had not studied it, but it made sense that women would be more vulnerable to um, sexually transmitted infections because, um, you know, we have an opening in which the, those bacteria or viruses can be deposited, and sit for a while, um, <laughs> whereas you know men are able to you know go wash up and and so the risk it just it always seemed to me would be higher for women correct the biology is such that we are more vulnerable and we're more vulnerable emotionally as well but that, that's another issue but in any case i started to become aware at that point that things are not exactly how they should be in my profession and um, you know, there were, there were many other examples, not just this particular one about the cervix. And I ended up writing a book called Unprotected um, about how ideology has had infiltrated my profession and, and, and that my patients were suffering because of it. Well, and that's such an interesting topic. And I don't know if you can address this now or, or in a little bit, but um, I hear so many people saying that, of course, um, of course, you know, those of us who are fighting against the medicalization and transitioning of children are wrong because the APA has accepted that standards of care and the um, endocrine society has accepted that it is standards of care and the American Pediatric Association has accepted as standards of care. And when you hear this, it's sort of like, well, yeah, obviously these are the people who are um, charged with taking care of children, um, children's mental and physical health. How on earth would they adopt standards that would be harmful to kids? And yet Sweden released just in the last couple of days an announcement saying, well, it turns out <laughs> we, we really don't have any evidence to support this and it's potentially very dangerous. So, so can you address how these um, standards of care or, or accepted guidelines are, are, are brought into um, some kind of uh, you know, a society or a- That's very, very important. You, Aaron, you're, you're bringing up um, a, a, a critical, critical point. Um, and it's so important that people understand there is no consensus among doctors. What has happened in these large organizations is that small activist members uh, have uh, taken over uh, certain issues within the large organizations. I'll speak about the American Psychiatric Association because that's what I know best. Um, so let's say, you know, they have a uh, caucus uh, or a committee, I'm not sure what it's called, of, of LGBT issues. And the um, members of that committee are chosen by the president of the APA. And uh, they're cherry-picked individuals. Um, 
and if if you go, I have one of the documents from 2012, um, which uh, was a uh, committee a, a policy statement on uh, whether there's enough data to come out with guidelines for the treatment of what was then called GID, gender identity disorder. And when you look at the members that were on that committee, uh, I think there were nine of them. Seven, you just have to Google their names and you see that they are people who are activists. Yes, that, that I consider myself an activist and I'm not, you know, not afraid to say so, to say what I believe in and, um, and to substantiate it. The people that are on, that were on that committee are, are also activists and they have certain beliefs and certain values that they are promoting. And they came, so their committee, um, and this happens over and over again, this is basically the way it works, that their committee came up with certain conclusions. So what I wanted to point out is at the very top of this report, mm -hmm. okay, it says, the findings, opinions, and conclusions of this report do not necessarily represent the views of the officers, trustees, or all members of the American Psychiatric Association. Views expressed are those of the authors, um, that, that there were nine doctors on the committee and that at least seven of them and possibly eight were, are activists, and that they have a disclaimer right on top that says that these are not the views of all the members of the American Psychiatric Association. And what happens is that these articles and these reports and policy statements come out and then the public is led to believe that there's a consensus among doctors. And that um, particular um, switch from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria is really critical. Um, you know, as a kid, I, I had gender identity disorder. Um, and, and it's so important for people to understand that that, that, um, that disorder causes a lot of discomfort, a lot of suffering, a lot of maladaptive behaviors and, and needs to be addressed. Whereas gender dysphoria is sort of this like kind of amorphous diagnosis that suggests almost that, that the discomfort that the child is having is coming from how the world is interacting with them. Would you mind kind of discussing that a little bit? It was a very, very big deal to uh, change what happened between the DSM-4 and DSM-5 um, to eliminate the gender identity disorder diagnosis and instead and replace it with the uh, gender dysphoria. Now, I think it's also important for your listeners to your watchers to know that the, that the change from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5 was a, um, uh, was filled with, uh, uh, hostile um, and, and hostility and conflict between the psychiatrists that were um, work, working on it. it. It took years. In fact, there two books came out. <laughs> two books came out from APA leaders about the DSM-5 um, explaining why it was done so poorly. Wow. Uh, People are led to believe that there's a consensus about all these issues and that, um, you know, the DSM is, is, which is the Bible, so to speak, of, of the mental health field, that it's, you know, like, was, you know, oh. just, you know, you know, it's, it's the, it's the word, it's, it's the law of the land. It's, it's, it's how psychiatrists see um, emotional disorders, and and, that, and that's just not the case. Uh, as people people need to understand that. So I, for one, would have kept the GID, gender identity disorder, diagnosis. Um, and what you said was correct, Erin, that the shift from gender identity disorder to gender dysphoria was a very massive, very um, 
noteworthy um, shift because instead of saying that when a when a person um, uh, has a sense of disconnection from their biology, instead of calling that a disorder, what they're doing is they're calling the anxiety that they have from it the disorder. So if they have that disconnect from their um, biology, meaning you know a girl, a, a, a biological female who um, you know is is uncomfortable is severely uncomfortable with the development of breasts and getting her period and her female appearance. Um, instead of calling that you know, and she wishes to change, she insists that she's not a female, she insists that she's male and that she um, should have a penis and not have breasts, that instead of calling that a disorder, that if she doesn't have um, dysphoria or anxiety or um, emotional, you know, suffering over that, if she just has it, but she's feeling fine about it, then that's not a disorder whatsoever. That's not a, what they're trying to say when in changing the diagnosis from GID to, to gender dysphoria. I don't know, am I, am I making myself clear? Yeah, they're that makes a lot of sense. And it's, you know, one of the things that I'm really curious about is with these changes in sort of the way in which um, what I would call is a disorder is conceptualized is that they, they, they don't want it to be labeled a mental health issue but then they want insurance to cover treatments and interventions. And so this becomes very confusing um, because if it's, if it's not a disorder, then why do they need interventions? Well, this is one of the big issues, of course, that it, you know, some people wanted to remove it completely from the DSM, but then there would be no diagnosis, no code to write you know, on the insurance claim. And so they, it, it was kept. That was one of the big reasons that it was kept. Um, the, uh, but the other thing is that I want to point out is the intellectual dishonesty. What other condition is there that is not a disorder, but requires medication and surgery for treatment? And requires others to change their behavior and beliefs in order to accommodate that person. I mean, to me, it's, it's, I feel as someone who, you know, acknowledges that I had a mental health issue, I feel like they're stigmatizing mental illness with this approach because they're, they're trying so hard to insist that this isn't a mental health issue. And I feel like that really hurts people who do have mental health issues. And, and, and the absurdity of it, as you pointed out, if you have in any other case, somebody who has this kind of delusional thinking, who has this kind of self-hatred, who has this dissociative um, problems, they're going to be um, given appropriate mental health treatment. But in this one case, because we don't want to hurt their feelings, <laughs> we say, oh no, you don't have mental health. Somehow you have like a gendered spirit that's been born into the wrong body. Um, it's very confusing. Well, it's, it's confusing because it's really based on a fraudulent idea. And this brings us back to, in the beginning, you asked me how I first became aware. Um, and when I was at UCLA and kind of in the middle of the um, I don't know how to call it, but um, the radical um, the, the world views really that that want that feel that the world would be a better place if the distinctions between male and female were eliminated. I think that that's one of the central themes here, that belief. Now that belief, um, you know, is, is an idealistic notion that, that people have come up with. The thing is that um, it, it goes against what we know in this century, uh, the science that we have in this century about male and female differences. And I, I like to keep this book over here right by me, which is a very huge, heavy book. 
and it's called wow. Principles of Gender Specific Medicine. <laughs> um, the reason that this is such an important book and such an important area is that um, we, we now know that without a doubt, you know, we have voluminous evidence that there are differences between male and female in every system of the body. Okay, not just the reproductive system, the, the cardiovascular system, the immune system, the neurological system, the mus musculoskeletal system, the digestive system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, and this book has, you know, chapters on each of those systems and, and all, for example, this is so fascinating. You know, every, almost every cell in the body um, has a nucleus and in the nucleus is the DNA and in the DNA is either in two X's or an X and a Y. Now, if, if a person, if a woman has a kidney transplant, she will do better. She, she you know, the, 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 one of the problems in getting a transplant is rejection of the new, of the new organ. So if a female needs a kidney transplant, she will do better with a female kidney because a kidney from a male will have all those Y chromosomes in every single kidney cell. Um, I mean, some of your, some of the watchers may be thinking, well, you know, what, what difference does that make to, to the discussion of transgenderism? But it, it really does make a difference because we're leading kids to believe, you know, we're leading young, vulnerable, as you know, kids are drawn to this who have some vulnerability usually, um, neurological or psychiatric, social, and they're being led to believe that if you're, if you feel like a boy, you're a boy. And if you feel like a girl, you're a girl. Trans women are women. That, that's, that's, that's just not correct. Right, it's, it's a lie. I mean, bottom line, it's, it's, it's promoting a lie that's, that's very harmful to children. And it's, it's interesting because you bring up these differences. Um, and I used to work at an institutional review board that reviewed um, protocols for, for um, research. And one of the things that was coming out of the Health and Human Services is that we need to start including more women in these protocols because medications and treatments um, work differently on female physiology than they do on male physiology. And historically, all we've looked at is male physiology. So we were just getting to a point where there was a mandate to, to, to have equal representation of men and women in these um, protocols. But now we have um, men coming in and saying they're women who, you know, if, if doctors say, well, well, actually, we have to put you in as a male in this protocol, that they could get in trouble. And so these, these you know, medical experiments that, that are going to help us to understand how to treat women are going to be undermined if we accept the concept that somebody becomes a woman just because they believe they're a woman. Well, it, I mean, it's madness. It's madness on so many levels. Uh, and, and I have to say that I, I don't understand. There must be some, how can there not be cognitive dissonance? Um, because even in this book, there's a few chapters on transgenderism and um, the doctors that, that are writing those chapters use terms like um, assigned sex at birth. <laughs> you know, you, you have to laugh like, you know, it, 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 we know that with conception, um, the in 99.99 percent of cases um the fetus is either xy or xx and that uh after just two months two months after conception so when the embryo uh or fetus is is uh 
is just eight weeks old is when the, um, the Y chromosome begins to uh, give instructions uh, to, the, to the testes to, to uh, uh, secrete testosterone, which then you know, goes to the brain and masculinizes the brain. Uh, and this is before there can be any uh, society influence and gender stereotypes. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so can you talk about intersex? Because this is something that um, is used over and over and over to push this agenda is trans activists will say, well, there's that tiny little proportion that is, um, you know, that has uh, chromosomal abnormalities such as Kleinhaber syndrome, um, Turner syndrome, where, you know, there's, there's a disorder of sexual development. And that proves that we're not dimorphic. That proves that there's something between male and female, which is absurd, um, you know, I believe, because, you know, if somebody's born without a leg, it, it still means we're bipedal surf, you know, species. It just means that that, that person was born without a leg. But this is something that has been um, used very compellingly in uh, legislative hearings to convince legislators that there is this, you know, there's this little bit of doubt that maybe there is some something besides male and female out there. Well, of course you're right. Um, I think the best thing to do is listen to the intersex people and they're on Twitter and they're, they're on social media and they're um, very angry that they're being, that the transgender uh, industry is using their existence to justify their ideology. Uh, it's true. There's, there are rare conditions in which, uh, you know, there's either genetic abnormalities in which people have um, chromosomal, uh, they're not XX, they're not XY. There's also, uh, so that would be a, a genetic disorder. There's endocrine disorders uh, in which, you know, the, the hormonal production is not normal. And so the genitals can be um, not, you know, out, outside the range of the 99.99% .99 of individuals. But like you said, the fact that there are exceptions to the rule doesn't mean that you can go and tell little kids that um, male and female is on a spectrum and that, you know, XX, that the spectrum on one end is XX and on the other end is XY. And then in between, there's like, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Well, and one thing that, you know, I, I could be wrong here, so correct me if I'm wrong here, but those conditions can be testified, um, tested for and verified. So if somebody is intersex, um, they can, they can, they know that it's not like it's a feeling, it's of a course. fact. <laughs> of course, of course. And it's not fluid. Like that is who they are for the whole, you know, for their entire lives. Um, whereas gender ideology says that it's a feeling, it's a self-perception, which of course could change from day to day. And uh, of course, the thing is though, another intellectual dishonesty thing, it's only fluid in one direction, right? Yeah, they get very upset when people flow in the other direction. <laughs> yes, like the salmon, you know how the salmon jump like against. <laughs> Yeah, it's like they just are like, no, 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 you, you can't, you can't do this. <laughs> well, it's interesting that you say that because I've heard a couple of responses when I talk about being a trans kid. They say, first of all, it must not have been so bad. And I'm like, well, it was bad enough that I had to have years and years of therapy and that my school psychologist got involved. So I think it might have been an issue. <laughs> they say I've internalized transphobia and I'm actually a guy and I'm just internalizing that hatred, which is interesting um, because that means that I'm actually in a homosexual relationship with my husband. Um, <laughs> And the other thing is they say, well, you were never really trans in the first place. And I'm like, well, if I was never really trans in the first place, isn't that exactly the point? I mean, 
if if kids i mean if if kids i because what they say is that kids identify identity is sacrosanct like what a kid says they are is what they are and so any in instance of a detransitioner saying wait a minute <laughs> it turns out i was wrong is evidence that this whole ideology is flawed i mean it really is so outrageous i mean we're laughing but when you think about it you know they're saying that you know you you what the, the child knows themselves no one knows better than this child and the child has the maturity and the cognitive ability to make all these decisions and to know who they are even if they're 10 8 right but you a grown woman okay you can't you don't know who you are <laughs> they know better than you right yeah, it's, it's really concerning. So, so on a more serious note, can you talk about what happens to a child like me who developed gender dysphoria as a result of a horrible trauma, who is told you are right, you were born in the wrong body and you should go ahead and transition. Can you talk about what that might do to a child who has actually got this you know, huge trauma that needs to be processed sure. that is being told, oh, you, you're right, you're actually a male. Um, to begin with, the trauma which is causing this uh, disordered thinking and this emotional turmoil won't be addressed. And that is, that is, that's a crime because that will follow the child into the rest of her life. And she will have been disenfranchised of that trauma and that grief that needs, and that anger that needs to be worked through and addressed and healed. So that will be taken away from her. That's number one. Number two is that she will be led to believe that she's a mistake, her body's a mistake, um, which is also criminal because I agree with, you know, no child is, is born in the wrong body. Um, so to go through your whole life thinking that there was some sort of mistake and that your, your brain and the rest of your body didn't match not only is that impossible, that's like saying your little finger doesn't match with the rest of your body and you need it removed. I mean, your brain is your body. Um, am I frozen? Nope, you look good. <laughs> so if this girl um, then is given puberty blockers, um, she'll be prevented, well, she the the adults around her will then be affirming that she's a mistake and uh she will not be allowed to go through what is a normal completely normal and uh necessary part of human development which is puberty puberty is necessary um for the development of of uh, you know are uh, physically, emotionally, and cognitively. Um, puberty is essentially a time in which um, there's, you know, a flooding of, of hormones um, in, in females' estrogen and in males' testosterone. And uh, there are very significant changes in the brain, um, as well as uh, in the body, there's the secondary sex characteristics. Um, and what we know is that the vast majority of, of young kids who are, who do go through puberty, then um, reach a sense of peace. I mean, the vast majority of kids who have dysphoria about their bodies um, reach a sense of acceptance and peace about their physical, about their bodies, which is exactly what we want. I, I, who, who would prefer for them to become lifelong patients, which is, you know, what happens, as you know, on the other route. So she would be, um, she would be prevented, uh, first she would get the blockers, and then as we know, 
everyone that gets blockers essentially goes to cross-sex hormones. So when she starts taking those cross-sex hormones at about 16 or, or whenever it is, I mean, she could probably get it earlier. Yeah, actually, Johanna Olson Kennedy is recommending that children of eight years old get on the hormones and the blockers at the same time. She actually has an NHS study whereby she modified the protocol for eight years old, eight years old to go on puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones at the same time, which is astonishing. So those little kids will go through. They will, they, they will. Yeah. They I don't they know will, what's going to happen to them because yeah. it's just a study. I mean, it's just, it's horrifying. It is horrifying. Anyway, getting back to what will happen when a girl um, is given testosterone, she'll basically, she's going to go through premature menopause. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, her vagina will change um, in a way, in ways that it shouldn't until she's in her fifties. The walls, there's, there's vaginal, there's atrophy of the, of the walls of the vagina, meaning that they get thinner mm -hmm. and drier and um, you know, with a vagina like that, you don't have uh, much sexual pleasure. Um, she will be, um, well, she'll be sterilized. I mean, if she's put on the blockers and then the opposite sex hormones um, and she never gets her period, and those eggs in her ovaries never get a chance to mature, then uh, she's, she's sterilized. And, you know, it, that's a whole other discussion, the um, sterilization of these children. Um, infertility is, is one of the main causes of depression in adults. Oh, wow. And while it's true that, that some adults don't want children, um, to take away the option, uh, the, the offices of infertility experts are filled with, with women in their late 30s and early 40s who always thought they didn't want children and then realized that they do. Well, and for me, having a child was so healing um, because I had such anger at my body. I had felt so violated. And then when they put my daughter in my arms, I mean, it was just, I can't even explain it because I had this connection with a person I'd never had before. And suddenly I was, I felt like my body was okay. My body had done something beautiful. And then when I nursed her, I was like, oh, that's why we have these. You know, it was very healing. Um, I yeah. felt, you know, it was probably the first time where I, I sort of got through that intense body hatred. Um, and so it can oh, be so healing to have a child. That's beautiful. I'm writing a book now. I don't know if you know that, that I'm writing something for girls. I mean, my passion is protecting girls and educating them about their health and their bodies. Um, so I'm writing something now to, for parents to give their girls that will help them, um, I mean, not necessarily girls that are struggling with gender issues, but for everyone to really appreciate the wonders of being female. And I think that's so important right now because a lot of times now girls are just given this message that they're vulnerable, that they're victims, or that they don't even exist because of this whole transgender ideology. I think we need to really celebrate women and girls. And that's something that I feel like rather than saying we're exactly the same as men and boys, we need to be saying we're different and that's good. You know, we need to, we, you know, this, this whole movement in, in ostensibly is celebrating diversity and we should be celebrating how men and women are differently in my opinion. I think that's part of the problem that we've had is that we've tried to pretend like they're exactly the same and they're not. Of course, that's a big problem. Um, you know, you, you, can, you can try and run from your biology but you're gonna, you're gonna pay a big price. But the reason I thought of when you were discussing having your um, your daughter, was it a girl? Yeah, it was my daughter. daughter. And nursing her is, I'm writing the chapter now on motherhood. And um, there's so, oh, the research, I mean, the stuff about um, 
infants and mothers and how the attachment begins in the womb um, is so fascinating. Uh, and so I, I just love doing this work and um, you know, I, I hope to make that, I hope that book will be available um, in not too long. Yeah, I'm excited that it'll be out there. I think it's much needed um, for, for girls. Yeah, for, yeah. and of wanted. course, you know, it'll, it'll be banned on Amazon. So I'll be <laughs> probably good company there. Yeah, we're a good company. <laughs> so I um, want to touch on something that you mentioned a little bit about the puberty blockers, because another thing that doctors um, who are pushing this narrative say is that puberty blockers are 100% reversible. And just logically, that makes no sense because you're, you're inducing a developmental delay. Um, but can you, can you talk about sort of, um, my understanding is that, that, that puberty is a process and so, we, and, and it takes a couple of years to go through. So if you block somebody, physiologically, their body might come back and they might be able to go forward and develop the way they would have. But have, has it, have they really, you know, is it really 100% reversible? You know, um, we, uh, let me answer you by saying this. Part of the um, fraudulent nature of, of what the gender industry is, is teaching is that they're, they're trying to present present humans at, like like we're like Legos. Mm -hmm. Okay, you could take this part off for a while and, you know, like stop building it for a while and then come back to it in a few years, you know, or, or you know, just surgically like take off these a few Legos from this area and replace it with a different kind of Legos and voila, you know. Yeah. Yeah. We're not Legos. We are a infinitely complex, you know, system that's, that is, I mean, every, just, just, you know, for us to be able, Aaron, for you and I to be able to be sitting here right now, talking, thinking, interacting, breathing, you know, our hearts are pounded, you know, uh, everything working properly, it, it, it's endlessly complex. Um, and my father, who, who was a physician, used to say, he was a neurologist, and he used to say about the brain, like, that he said, thank goodness I don't have to understand how my brain works in order for it to work. <laughs> it wouldn't be working very well. That's a really good point. We are so complex. And, and that's what's so concerning is that, that, that they're using interventions that have not been tested um, and, and that we really have no idea what the outcome's going to be. Well, exactly. And, and we know that the blockers um, uh, have an effect on uh, bone, bone density and, uh, you know, possibly in, in other areas. I mean, I, I want to look at what happened in Sweden and their reasons for their um, <clears throat> decision to discontinue the blockers, and I want to see exactly what research that they were looking at, but it's, it's a very good development. But as a psychiatrist, what I'd like to point out is you have to think of the child socially. Now, all their most, I mean, of their peers are going through puberty. Their bodies are changing. Their voice is changing. They're growing breasts. They're getting taller, they're getting interested in sex. They're all these incredible, these changes that happen when you go through puberty. And you know what? You're still 10 years old and you look like you're 10 years old too. Just thinking about an interview that I saw where a boy was put on um, puberty blockers when he was 14. So he was, he was older than a lot of these kids are. And he said his, um, his penis and testicles shrunk to the size of a little child's. And after going off them, they, they didn't grow back. Um, <laughs> they may, they stayed that, I mean, he said he basically is a eunuch. Well, look, this, I, I, I really, it's, it saddens me, but I, I really believe this is gonna be one of the biggest medical catastrophes. Um, you know, it will come out as a medical catastrophe 
um, even more so than uh, what psychiatry did with the lobotomies um, in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, it, it's just a, it's, a, it's a terrible, terrible thing. But you can't blame the people that make these decisions because no. they're being misled. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, and that's something I think it's really important to um, to talk about because actually I'm writing a book right now too called The Transing of Our Children. And I'm really wanting to make it clear that that this is something being done to them. They're not, you know, even, even teenagers, this is being, this is an ideology that's being pushed on them. Um, and that's actually a, a nice um, segue because I wanted to talk to you about conversion therapy efforts and how, how you are really um, kind of limited and therapists in general are limited in, in how to treat some of these kids because of laws that, that require affirmation, um, that require therapists to affirm these kids. And so there are a lot of states where these children, you know, it's not, they have no other path, they have no other treatment path um, than to transition. That's true. And people are turning to me um, both because of those laws um, and because it's so almost impossible to find therapists um, and psychiatrists who will at least not automatically knee-jerk accept the child's beliefs about themselves and will want to dig deeper, which by the way is standard of care, if you look even at the WPATH standards of care it, and the APA and its pediatrician, they all say that you must explore um, the, the mental, the full mental health evaluation is necessary. And if there are mental health issues, they need to be addressed before starting on the course of transition. And that's simply being ignored. But Erin, I did want to, if we could, I just want to step backwards for one minute because you said you're writing a book about the transing of our children. And I want you to understand that you, the, the sex edu comprehensive, so-called comprehensive sex education um, that's in our schools includes the, ideo the gender ideology. It, it's, it's, it's presented as fact. At a very young age, as young as kindergarten, kids are being told that, that they get to choose what sex they are. It's no longer even about gender. It's about, you know, it's somehow um, the behaviors that you have and the likes and dislikes that you have actually somehow magically change the sex you were born. Um, or, or I guess as some would say, you, you acknowledge what the doctors didn't know because the doctors just sort of guess. Um, this is really scary that kids that young are being exposed to this ideology. But then again, any, you know, uh, it's an ide again, it's an ideology and ideologies, um, one of their goals is to reach children, is to reach young children. Um, Young children are like wet cement. Whatever comes their way and falls on them makes a lifelong impression. That's um, a quote from Chaim Gino, a famous child psychologist. They're wet cement and parents have to reach them first. And now this, that opens up a whole other discussion of how within the family do you go against everything that the child is seeing and hearing, but that's, you know, maybe we can do that another time. <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to emphasize that for those who are so, you know, avid um, supporters of comprehensive sex education need to understand that this is part of it, that gender ideology is part and parcel of comprehensive sex education. And I think that there are a lot of people who don't understand that connection. There are a lot of, um, you know, people who are like, you know, of course we want to have sex ed in the schools and they don't understand, first of all, how young it is that children are being exposed to this and, and also how um, blatant it is. This isn't just a subtle like reading of I am jazz. This is part of the curriculum. And besides the gender issues, there's a lot of other information that is not scientifically correct and that endangers kids. And that was my 
second book, I mean, my first book was Unprotected. <clears throat> and then my second book was called You're Teaching My Child What? Um, about, about the lies of sex education. And there's a chapter in there about gender called Genderland. I wrote it in 2008. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And, and, um, and, and right there, you know, it was, it was already happening then. Wow. It was, it was, it was happening in wow. 2008. So now, um, because of, you know, some of these difficulties with working with kids, where is your practice heading as a psychiatrist? Right now, I'm focused on helping parents of gender confused kids. And when, and helping gender confused uh, young people with their anxiety and their depression and uh, trying to, you know, to treat that. Um, and I'm doing it online. Oh, good. Practice is uh, telepsychiatry. And uh, depending on the state that people are from, uh, I can either, you know, I, I can get licensed there. And so far it's, uh, it's, it's quite a journey. Um, it's very meaningful work. And are you accepting new clients? Yes. Okay. That's good to know. So yes. if somebody's watching this and, and is um, interested in becoming one of your clients, um, would the best thing to do for them to be to reach out to me or to reach out to you or how's the best way for them to get in touch? Um, they could reach out to me directly. I'm at Miriam Grossman, MD at hotmail.com. Okay. Um, I just want to mention that, you know, the parents of these kids, of gender confused kids also need our attention. Yeah. They're being, tr I mean, it's so, the, the, the parents that I know who have taken a stand on this and said, no, I'm not buying into this ideology, have, um, have suffered so much. They've suffered loss of friendships, loss of family members. Um, their kids are already angry with them because they're not, you know, doing the affirmation. They are, they, they have to be so strong and just, just, um, I, I applaud them for being, for, you know, for taking a stand on this and for standing up for their kids, because it is so hard. Yeah, and not only the ones that have gone so far as to take a stand, you know, critical of the child's gender choice, but just like the whole thing that it comes, it can come out of the blue and just to be able to understand like this whole world of, of the gender ideology, you know, they don't even, it, it's, it's, it's a new world. Parents are blindsided. They don't, they don't know where to turn first to try and understand all this. And when they go to therapists or, you know, the teachers or wherever it is that they turn, um, pediatricians, you know, they're often told, or they're almost always told, you know, you have to sell it. This is a good thing, you know, you have to only affirm, affirm, affirm. And the parents saying like, what? Like, you know, last week she was dancing around in a pink tutu. <laughs> and now she's talking about, she wants testosterone. Like what happened, you know, what's going on? That's the, that's the thing that's so confusing as someone who actually experienced gender identity disorder. When I'm listening to these stories, I'm like, that's nothing. I mean, for me, it was like my entire childhood was sort of formed around this difficulty. Um, and yet we have teenagers now who, like you said, um, didn't have any signs of having these issues at all. And then suddenly, you know, within a week or two, go from, you know, maybe I'm non-binary to I'm transgender, I want to go on medications so quickly without having any of that history of um, distress. Well, so yeah, I mean, most of your listeners probably are aware that there's a diagnosis of rapid onset gender dysphoria, and um, hopefully they're they're aware of the um, uh, sort of infectious nature of uh, of this. That 
groups of friends um, decide together that they're groups of, of female friends usually um, decide that they're uh, no longer girls and they're either you know non-binary or, or males and um, you know this described very well in Abigail Schreier's book which I recommend to everybody um, <clears throat> also <clears throat> sorry um, parents need to be aware of the power of social media, obviously, but it, it, it just needs to be said again and again. YouTube, those videos are, that are on there, the um, kids start watching them 24-7, and it, they're, they're just like flooded with, you know, these people online that are telling their stories. Um, we don't hear the PS to their stories. Um, and... It's, uh, it, it, it's a brainwashing, you know, this is, it, it, it's a, oh, now we get into the whole issue of the, the cult-like nature of it, which Maria um, describes, you know, so well in her book, Kef, Maria Keffler, mm -hmm. um, in her book, Detox, Detrans, Desist. Yes. Yeah, is, I recommend it for any parent who's, um, probably any parent of a teenager needs to know what's out there. I strongly recommend it. Everybody. Teenager, anyone who has children, actually. Yeah, probably anybody who has children because this is starting, you know, as you mentioned, it's just, you know, the kid, it's, it's hitting kids younger and younger. Right. And very, it's, very it's so heartbreaking as, um, you know, as a parent, I have, I have a, an older teenager and seeing the girls that my son played with and went to school with transition is just it's just so confusing and heartbreaking and infuriating because these are girls that you know I watched in childhood being girls knowing that they were girls feeling comfortable being a girl and now being told if you have any discomfort whatsoever about being a girl or if you just want to be a boy go ahead and medicate and and damage your body and it just you know I don't know if if that's typical of, of medications that doctors give medications like this to children when they come in and say what they want. But to me, it's, it's just shocking how little, um, like you said, we have these, stand even, even the standards of care that people claim they're following that, that in my view, aren't great. They're not being followed. You know, WPATH says, wait till 16 to start on puberty blockers. I'm hearing of doctors, as I said, Johanna Olson Kennedy, giving them to eight-year-olds. Um, Robert Garofalo at Lori's Children's Hospital, giving them to 13-year-olds. They're not even following those minimum guidelines. Yeah. Look, there's a lot of horror stories and I don't know, we'll get to a, there's gonna be like a tipping point. When, when is the tipping point? So well, the fact that, that both the UK and Sweden have started to take a more um, cautious approach to me is really encouraging. It's like the first domino fell um, and hopefully others will start falling too um, because there isn't, a, you know, there isn't evidence for this. And, and I think that that's probably the most important takeaway is that, that we're, we're performing a massive experiment on vulnerable children. I mean, we're the doctors, we're the surgeons. Yeah. You know, they're doing the mastectomies. I mean, taking healthy breasts off of a little girl, I mean, it's just criminal. It's criminal. And it's so disturbing to think that my colleagues, um, some of them just, you know, want to want to get rich and have no, no ethical dilemma. I mean, uh, I, honestly, I don't get it. Yeah. I would like to make a request and that is um, if there are people listening to this who would be willing, um, I would like D-trans, D-transitioners, um, I would love to talk to them. And I, I want to understand and hear detransitioners much, much better as a, as a psychiatrist. We, we need to hear them. I mean, if I was in charge of the APA, I would have them, you know, 
front and center on every journal and, you know, giving speeches at the conferences, like, we need to hear from them. And many of them are very articulate and bright. I mean, I, 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 I watch them on social media and I'm so impressed. Um, so I guess that is what I would end with today. I can be reached at Miriam Grossman, MD, at hotmail.com. Uh, and I would love to speak to you. We could even talk anonymously if you want. But I, I want to hear your, your stories. And their stories are so compelling. And like you said, so many of them are, are very gifted, articulate. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, I've had the experience where, where they're afraid to speak out about what's happened to them because they get bullied, they get ostracized. Um, and, and to me, that's, you know, just adding insult to injury for what they've been through. So like you, I want to create safe spaces for them. I want to, you know, just let them know that this wasn't something they did to themselves because a lot of them have, have guilt and shame surrounding even that. So it's like just piling on what they have to, you know, sort through in order to, to get back to good mental health. Of course. Anyway, um, this was great and I'd love to do it again. And I just want to um, again, tell you, Aaron, that I'm, I'm overjoyed with what you're doing. When I wrote my book, um, You're Teaching My Child What, and I, you know, discovered everything that was going on with the gender industry, um, there was no one, we weren't even close to anyone like yourself and others who are speaking out and writing and, um, it, it just, it's, it's some light in the darkness. Yeah. Well, and thank you for speaking out too, because um, there are so many doctors I speak to who, again, they would like to speak out, but they don't want to lose their practice. They don't want to be bullied. They don't want to be harassed. So um, it's so important that we have doctors like you willing to take a stand. So thank you.